afternoon, everybody. My name is Sally Whipple. I'm the director of Connecticut's Old State House, and I'm very happy to welcome you here on this cold and rainy day for our lunchtime lecture series. Today we're going to be talking about the fight to vote, the right to vote. We felt that this would be a timely topic for us as we approach the elections, and I really hope that it will motivate you to vote, or if you're already planning on voting, that it will motivate you to encourage someone you know to vote. Um, we also have registration, voter registration, out in the Great Hall of the Old State House. And what are, better place would there be to register to vote? And if you've already registered, you can pick up some information there so that you can encourage others to register as well. I also want to take a moment to tell you about some programs that are coming up next month because they relate to the program today. On November 19th, in conjunction with the Hartford Young Professionals and Entrepreneurs, we're going to be trying a new kind of program. It's an evening program where we are going to um, get a group of civic leaders together to come and just sit with people and talk about next steps that they can take in becoming civically active. Especially after an election, half of us will be happy, half of us will be sad, but a lot of us will probably be saying, what can I do to help impact the next collect, connect, um, election, or what else can I do aside from vote? So we'll have people there who can talk to you about the kinds of small steps you can take to make a difference in your community. Then two nights later, we'll have a town hall meeting in this room, which will be live cast, um, broadcast live on CTN. And that is going to be done in conjunction with the Parent Leadership Training Institute. And what we'll be doing is showing real-life examples of people who learned how to build their civic skills and learned how to take actions in small ways that resulted in big changes for their communities. So those are two kinds of different programs that you can really be involved in. And I think they're going to be um, great at helping set some people off on the path to civic action. So. Um, if you are not on our email list or following us on Facebook and Twitter, you can sign up today when you fill out your survey, or you can sign up online, and that will keep you up to date on all of the programs going on um, at the Old State House. And now um, I'd like to introduce you to today's program. Um, unfortunately, Diane Smith cannot be here today, but she has um, very nicely arranged for Elizabeth McGuire to lead our panel today. Elizabeth has been a producer at CTN for nine years, and she is a veteran radio and TV broadcaster, having worked at WTIC, WTNH, and Country 925. Um, she's also a very good sport to step in for the last, at the last minute and lead this panel, which should be a really rousing discussion. So please join me in welcoming and thanking Elizabeth for graciously stepping in to help us today. Elizabeth? Thank you very much, Sally, and uh, thank you for inviting me. Um, as Sally said, Diane was called out of town last minute, and so um, I agreed to step in. Big uh, shoes to fill, but I am delighted to be here, and I thank you for, for inviting me. It's nice to see all of you on a rainy afternoon. So here we are. We are less than a month away from the big election. And, of course, the question is, who will vote? Or maybe how many people will vote. You know, what will the voter turnout be? Uh, I just heard a discussion on the radio uh, yesterday uh, talking about voter turnout and how critical it is going to be this year, even more critical than other years, because uh, we have uh, such a closeness in the presidential race, not to mention our senatorial race here in Connecticut. Um, there have been lots of voter issues in the news in the last year or so. We've heard um, a lot about voter ID laws, for example, very hot issue, with one side of that issue saying that we need the law to uh, prevent fraud, and then the other side calling these laws an attempt to keep certain voters away from the polls. Voting by mail is on the rise, and a recent article on the front page of the New York Times recently warns that error and fraud may come along with that. In Connecticut, there have been a number of reforms aimed at making it easier to vote, but Will those reforms draw more people to the polls? We hope. Um, we know that a huge number of people in this country just sit out uh, many elections. And, of course, that would be very discouraging for um, many of those people who fought so hard to win the right to vote for women and for minorities. So we are going to hear a, a bit about that struggle today. Uh, and uh, then we're going to um, ask uh, everyone to join in the discussion with a very interesting panel that we have uh, put together together. 
for you this afternoon. But first, let me introduce our first speaker. Dr. Stephanie Chambers is an associate professor of political science at Trinity College in Hartford. Her research and teaching interests include urban politics, racial and ethnic politics, and women in politics. Dr. Chambers is also actively engaged in educational issues in the Hartford community. She is faculty director of the Magnet School Partnership at Trinity College, and she serves on the board of Achieve Hartford, a local education fund. So it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Stephanie Chambers. So thank you, Elizabeth, and good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for coming out again in the rain. And I was invited to come and speak a little bit about the importance of the right to vote, particularly in terms of women. Um, but I also want to talk a little bit about some other groups. Women, as many of you are probably aware, turn out in higher numbers today to vote than men. And that's been a trend that we've seen since the 1980s. Um, the struggle for the right to vote is another issue, and I'll talk about that, and that was a, a, a tremendous struggle for women for many decades. But today what we see is that women are voting in higher numbers, but there are a lot of other groups that are not voting in terms of their eligibility in um, elective um, participation. So we see people like um, young people, people who are poor, um, racial and ethnic minorities like Latinos, African Americans, um, American Indians even, churning out in very low numbers to vote. And that's a concern in terms of our democracy. But today, most of my comments will focus on the struggle for women in getting the right to vote. So I'd like to begin by telling you that when I teach my classes in American politics, I tell students that democracy is a process. And if we look at democracy as a process, it really is, it gives us a, um, I think, a more optimistic way to look at our political system, rather than focusing, for example, on the fact that only 50% of us or less participate in elections, we can look over time at our country's history and see, and see that we've made great strides over time and that there have been these heroic struggles where people have fought and died for this right to vote. Um, and that's sort of how I prefer to look at the system rather than focusing on the low voter turnout that we see. So I'd like to stimulate people to vote because this has been a struggle and we are a democracy as a process. So if we look back and we think about the, the men who wrote the Declaration of Independence or even the Constitution, what we see is that there are these principles, these defining principles of a democracy that are outlined in those documents. So things like individual liberty, equality, freedom, all of these sort of concepts, these broad concepts were really central to what was being created in these documents where we were leaving um, British rule and we were establishing our own, own government. Now, at the same time that these men were very courageous, heroic, risked their lives to write these documents that, have, that are noteworthy because they've lasted over 200 years, that our country has sort of um, run under this constitution that's only been changed 27 times, so that's very, very few. We had a situation where the framers of the constitution were not factoring in the rights of Native Americans women, slaves, they were talking about these concepts, um, inalienable rights, rights that the government couldn't take from people, the right to participate in democracy, that everyone was equal. These ideas and these concepts are very important to the foundation of our democracy, but yet when our country was being created, these were not things that were considered rights for everybody. It was only a certain segment of the population. So it's been a huge struggle for groups to be able to um, earn a place at the table, I guess, to get a place at the table. They've had to struggle and fight for these rights. And I think there's no better way to see democracy as a process um, other than looking at, or the best way to see it, is by looking at the right to vote or expansion of the franchise. So we can see how our country, from its foundation to today, has become more democratic over time if we think of democracy as a process and the expansion of the right to vote. So that's what I want to talk about for a little while today. Now, the origins of the women's suffrage movement um, go back all the way to the beginning of our country's history. So someone like um, Jane Addams had a famous quote where she told her husband when he was going to the Constitutional Convention not to forget the ladies. And so this concept of women being equal and, and, um, and that they should have equal rights in our democracy has been alive and well um, for our country's history. But the organized campaign for women's suffrage can be traced back to the, the involvement of women in the anti-slavery movement. And 
like many other movements, sometimes groups come to the table because they have experience with other types of causes. And anti-slavery or the abolition of slavery was a big issue for women. And despite the prevailing stereotypes at the time, it was not considered unladylike for women to participate in the abolitionist movement. It was tied to religious participation, and so it was seen as acceptable in society. So that idea of what a woman's, woman's place was in society um, typically didn't involve political involvement, but with anti-slavery, it was considered acceptable. The suffragists throughout time, and we see different periods of suffrage. Um, the suffragists throughout time were primarily white, middle class, well-educated, upper class often, um, and from pretty prestigious families. Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Lucretia Mott are probably names that you're familiar with. I have pictures of the two of them up here. And they attended an anti-slavery convention in London in 1840. And the U.S. was represented at this convention by men and women, but women had to stay in the gallery. They weren't able to participate. But during the time that these two women were at this convention, they had a conversation about the rights of women as well as the rights of blacks. And they decided that blacks weren't the only ones who needed to be liberated. So when they came back to the U.S., they and three other friends of theirs organized the Seneca Falls Convention. And that was in, um, that was in 1848. And so at this convention, they placed this small ad in the Seneca um, County Courier, inviting people to attend in July at this convention. And they were not only talking about the right to vote, but they were talking about all sorts of issues dealing with equality for women. So again, going back to the foundation of the country, they wanted to create a system where women were truly equal. And they came up with this document called the Declaration of Sentiments. And the Declaration of Sentiments was important it, in many ways, paralleled what we saw in the Declaration of Independence. It listed the grievances that women had with the way that the country was set up. Um, it also drew on the concept of inalienable rights, that there are certain rights that people have that the government cannot take away from them. And so they came up with this document that established this, this important, these important um, steps toward more equality for women. And um, they also had a set of resolutions designed to, designed to implement the Declaration of Principles. And these were drafted by Elizabeth Cady Stanton. And the resolutions included um, women's equality in education, because, of course, women weren't allowed to, they weren't given access to very many opportunities in education. Women's equality and property rights, which had been an issue for a very long time, where women had no property rights, oftentimes there were many women who would be, choose to remain single so that they could have some rights over property because when they got married, they lost all of those things um, to their husbands. Um, and also equality in divorce and child custody and the right to vote. And just as a side note, I sometimes tell my students that these same issues were on the table in the 1960s when we see the women's movement, some of these same important issues um, that women have continued to fight for. But... The other issue, of course, was the right to vote that was in there that they that they you know that, that Stanton really wanted to push. And of the 68 women who signed the Declaration of Principles in 1848, only one lived to cast her ballot in 1920. I think that's worth noting. So after this convention happened, and this was a really great consciousness raising um, exercise, women's rights meetings were held at both the national and local level um, for many years after that. However, when the Civil War broke out in 1861, um, women who had worked in the abolitionist movement, well, of course, everything sort of stopped because that, there was a more pressing issue, the war at the time. Um, but women who had worked in the abolitionist movement, once the Civil War ended, they assumed that as slaves were freed with the 13th Amendment and given citizenship with the 14th Amendment and given the right to vote with the 15th Amendment, they thought they would be part of this. And, of course, they weren't. Um, Republican legislators at the time, many of them supported the idea of women having the right to vote, but they felt that it would be too divi divisive at the time. So they didn't include that in the 15th Amendment, 
which was um, which was a real blow to women, the women who had fought for ending slavery and felt that they needed their rights as well. Um, and so what we saw was some tension. I'm not going to go into great detail, but there were periods of time within the women's suffrage movement where there was tension between different organizations about what sorts of strategies or tactics should be employed to reach their goal. It's sort of um, a parallel in some ways to what we see with same-sex marriage today. But the push for this idea of the right to vote was something that remained um, important to many women, despite differences in ideas of strategies and tactics. And um, someone earlier mentioned the film Iron Jawed Angels, which is a really good um, HBO film that was, uh, that was done, has a little bit of romantic, um, inaccurate information in it. But other than that, it's a good film that, that sort of chronicles what happened with women's suffrage. And you see Alice Paul, who was one of the sort of the second generation of suffragists, um, really risking her life with other women for this right to vote, getting, um, engaging in protest activities, civil disobedience that led to her arrest, um, force feeding, um, you know, there were women who really, who really struggled. And it's not just at the, at the national level, these national figures like Alice Paul. In Connecticut, thanks to my colleague Barbara Sisherman, who is a historian at Trinity, she wrote a really great article not that long ago about uh, the women in Connecticut and the role that they played in the right to vote, but also in um, reproductive rights issues. And so um, through Barbara Sisherman's research, I was able to learn more about Isabella Beecher Hooker and Catherine Houghton Hepburn. And I'd like to speak about those two women for a moment because it, it allows us to think, I think, a little bit more concretely about what was going on in Connecticut um, in terms of the leadership in the women's suffrage movement. So Isabella Beecher Hooker was the president of the Connecticut Women's Suffrage Association from uh, 1869 to 1900. And um, she and her husband were really focused on the idea of eliminate, the elimination of barriers that women faced in terms of the right to vote. Um, but they were also focused on women's property rights, and they were able to achieve, they were successful in getting the Married Women's Property Rights Act in 1877, which gave wives control over their property and earnings. And also in 1901, um, she was very important in pushing for the law giving mothers equal rights of guardianship over their children. And she was from a very prominent family, um, and she pushed for the right to vote. But Connecticut, I'm sad to say, was, um, was one of the states that was not one of the forerunners or one of the top states in pushing for women's right to vote um, or giving women the right to vote. There were a number of states, particularly starting in the West, that allowed women to vote in elections. Oftentimes it was school board elections or elections that sort of reflected what women's place in society was. Um, sometimes it would be if you were a widow, you could vote in school board elections or something like that. Connecticut was one of the states that resisted. Um, in 1893, women achieved the right to vote in school board elections in the state of Connecticut. So we were not one of the early states to, to grant women these rights. Um, a little bit later, during the second decade of the 20th century, we see the activism of Catherine Houghton Hepburn, who of course is the mother of the actress Catherine Hepburn. And again, um, from a very prominent family in Connecticut, well-educated, she had a, uh, a BA and a, a master's degree from Bryn Mawr. She was the wife of a very well-respected surgeon in the state. Um, and she advocated for women's issues for, for over 30 years. And she was a charismatic leader who attracted new members and funds to an organization that was really struggling to, to survive in the state. And she connected the, the state organization to the national campaign um, to, to pass this federal suffrage amendment. And she and other women in Connecticut worked hard to reach out to other organizations, including black churches, Jewish organizations, union halls, um, factory workers and immigrants, and they advocated for women's right to vote, but also for things like child labor laws, ending or creating child labor laws, um, and also job protections for women. So she played a very important role in the history of Connecticut in the right to vote. And then after women received the right to vote in 1920, um, Houghton Hepburn also played a pivotal role in the national birth control movement. She, along with um, Margaret Sanger, co-founded the organization that would become Planned Parenthood. So she's a noteworthy political um, figure in the state of Connecticut. And so going over some of these 
basic ideas. I know I've just sort of glan you know, given you a passing idea of the importance or the challenges that women's, women faced in getting the right to vote. It was actually 1920 when, um, even though there, was, there were amendments introduced um, consistently throughout the decades, uh, trying to get Congress and then, of course, the states to ratify an amendment to allow women um, the right to vote. It wasn't until 1920 that this happened, and I think it was Tennessee was the last state. It was a very close margin um, in, the, in Tennessee. It was a split vote on whether or not Tennessee should ratify, and there was a famous um, story where there was a young man, and I'm forgetting his name right now, um, Harry Burns, who had a letter from his mother that said, don't forget to be a good boy and vote for suffrage. And that was that, that sort of pivotal vote that allowed Tennessee to be one of the states to push for ratification. But it was, it was a heroic struggle. But I'd like to turn to contemporary issues, because I think some of this history is important for us to think about what's going on today. So if we were to have a truly representative democracy, and again, if I'm looking at democracy as a process, we should see a situation where we have true majority rule, for example. Majority rule would mean that eligible voters turn out to vote. And even in a presidential election year, we have about half of us doing that. Um, it, it's lower if you go down to uh, midterm elections where there's no presidential election. We see about 38 percent, 30 percent of people voting, eligible voters turning out. School board elections, notoriously low. Um, some of my colleagues who study comparative politics might say it's because we have um, too many elections compared to other industrialized democracies where they call people to the polls much less. In the United States, we call, call people to the polls quite often. But there are some other factors, I think, that contribute to the low voter turnout. And I think increasing voter turnout is important. Um, other factors, and I think we'll talk about some of these on the panel, but I think that, that a truly representative democracy would be a situation where there are no barriers for people. Um, one challenge we face in this country is that uh, registering to vote and voting is, a, voting is actually a two-step process, registration and voting. And especially among young people or people who are, who are mobile in their lives, understanding what the rules are in different states can be, can be challenging. Uh, I don't think we make this particularly easy. Many, I see this all the time with my students, for example, who are confused about where they should vote because they're in college. And do I vote with my parents? And if my parents are in another state, what's the rule in terms of how far in advance I have to register? And then how do I get an absentee ballot? It's a lot of steps, which I think could probably be simplified. I understand people are concerned about fraud, but um, it's, it's onerous for some people. Um, so increasing voter turnout is something that I think we should focus on. Um, and then also increasing the representation of underrepresented groups is also important. Um, even with, for example, women participating in elections at a higher rate than men, we still see that there are far fewer women in elective office. And that is the same issue for racial and ethnic minorities. We have very low representation of underrepresented groups in our democratic system. And perhaps seeing more people who reflect our composition as a society could increase the interest in voting among some people. And I'll leave you with one quote, which is from John Adams, um, one of the founders of our country's political system, of course. And he said that a representative democracy should be an exact portrait in miniature um, of the people at large as it should think, feel, and act like them. And without voting, it's very difficult to make that happen. You can come up and join us. Right? Am I jumping the gun, or do you want? Okay. <laughs> and while while everybody is getting set up, I will just remind you to please fill out your survey and um, and also to point out that we have a small exhibit that's on loan to us over in the corner, which features artifacts related to women's suffrage, and we were very pleased to have them here for you to enjoy today.
Elizabeth. Thank you, Sally. So joining uh, Dr. Chambers uh, today uh, our, on our panel, Secretary of the State Denise Merrill, who serves as our Chief Elections Official for the State of Connecticut. Um, throughout her career, Secretary Merrill has supported efforts to increase voter participation, improve transparency in government, and supported legislation designed to reduce the influence of special interests. She has been a leading voice on civic education in our schools, and this year, uh, Secretary Mer Merrill led an effort to measure and increase civic engagement uh, in our state. So welcome, Secretary. And uh, also joining us, uh, Sherry Quickmeyer, the Executive Director of Common Cause Connecticut. Common Cause defines itself as a nonpartisan grassroots organization dedicated to restoring the core values of American democracy, reinventing an open, honest, and accountable government that serves the public interest, and empowering ordinary people to make their voices heard in the political process. Welcome, Sherry. Secretary Merrill, I would like to start with you. Um, we hear a lot about voter turnout, particularly uh, in an election year, obviously, and uh, recently. Seems to me that, as Dr. Chambers um, said, that um, uh, voter turnout really is a measurement of our representative uh, democracy. Um, how are we doing um, in terms of um, our, our current voter turnout and um, your expectation in this presidential election? Uh, well, thank you. Thank you for having me here today. Uh, and, of course, this is a subject I pay a lot of attention to as Secretary of the State. And I think you heard the statistics, and I suppose, you know, Connecticut is a mirror image of exactly uh, what the professor was saying about the fact that we'll probably have about a third of our population uh, of eligible voters are not even registered to vote. And of that, uh, two-thirds that's left, uh, about 75, maybe we'll get to 80 percent of those will actually vote this year if we're, and I think it'll be pretty much true to form, which means we're at about 50 percent of eligible voters in this state actually show up. And I think that uh, you, you could not give us even a B on that one. Um, and I would say it's a crisis in this country. And I don't hesitate in saying that. Um, you know, you've heard the long struggles that we've had in this country getting everyone the right to vote. I think this is a much more complicated struggle, which is to get people to exercise the rights that have been fought and died for. Uh, and it's, it's very curious in a way, uh, because you see right unfolding before us in other parts of the world, people fighting and dying for exactly this right, the right to choose their leaders and not have a dictatorship. So, uh, you know, the juxtaposition, I think, is very stark. Um, and it's complicated because no one can quite figure out what's going on. I think you have to look under the statistics to see who exactly is it that's not voting in as large numbers. And you'll see that reflected in the campaigns and the issues that are being addressed. For example, uh, most of the, the, the largest voting bloc in this country, is, not surprisingly, are seniors. And that's a group of people who, uh, by and large, came out of the World War II generation and, you know, the 1960s and were, had a very different attitude, I think, toward voting for some fairly basic reasons. I mean, World War II brought the country together. And so people really feel, of that generation, feel that it's their duty to vote. I think even uh, in my generation, 60s and 70s, I don't think you would have admitted publicly that you weren't going to vote. That was just what you did as a citizen. I think the generation now that is not voting in as large numbers, uh, between you know, 18 and 30-ish, um, have a very different attitude toward voting. It's kind of optional. Uh, they feel that if they feel like it, they'll go do it. Uh, but if they don't see a candidate that particularly appeals to them or a party that particularly appeals to them, uh, they won't bother. And um, we're going to have to work hard to change that, I think. Some of it, I believe, is due to a different attitude towards civic education in the schools. I think in the 1950s and 1960s was absolutely a core part of the educational mission. Uh, today, with our emphasis on testing and skill development and jobs, uh, 
uh, I think you have a very different attitude toward the, the actual role of education in our society. So I think we have to take a hard look at what we are teaching our children in school. And then, of course, there's the modern focus on the modern media campaigns. I mean, it would be hard not to be negative about government today. These children are growing up in a very different world. Someone told me a story the other day. She has a five-year-old, and at one point he turned to her, and I guess I'll actually use candidates' names here, because he turned and he said, Mommy, Linda McMahon didn't pay her mortgage. I mean, this is what children are listening to, and we have to be honest with ourselves about that. You know, there, there's no way to shut off those television shows uh, in most households. Uh, so... You know, that's, that's the result, of course, of many uh, Supreme Court decisions and everything else that says we have utter, complete free speech in this country and no way to do some things like other countries have done. I'll give you an example. England. In England, one can only campaign for six weeks. It's just not allowed. So the campaign does not start until six weeks before the election. Uh, there's a lot of public television uh, employed. There's very little uh, paid TV advertisement about elections. Now, whether their elections actually end up being better, uh, you know, it's open for discussion. But it's certainly a different approach. So I think those are just some of the factors that have influenced the way that younger people feel about voting. Minority communities have always been uh, less inclined to vote. I think that also has complex reasons. I happen to be someone who thinks that the barriers to them are greater. And they're kind of psychological barriers in some cases, but I do believe, and uh, my policies reflect this, that we need to modernize the way we do voting. We need to reduce the barriers uh, that we have. For example, voter registration is very onerous in this country. Uh, as a matter of fact, many countries, you're not required to register. Whenever you become of age, you're automatically a voter. Now, what's wrong with that? You know, we, we go through, we have all these different things, like we sign up for Social Security. Why not then? I mean, you know, if you're eligible for Social Security, you're probably a citizen and you're 18 years old. Those are the two basic requirements. That's all. So I think we need to take a hard look at the way we're doing it. It's become very bureaucratic. That's the word I'd use. Um, you know, everybody's making sure you're on exactly the right list and that you're, you know, living at precisely that address. Why all that? You know, so we're looking at it right now. Well, you've touched on lots of different <laughs> issues in, in terms of why voter turnout um, uh, is so low. But I'd like to ask Sherry, uh, kind of back up a little bit from your perspective. I expect that you do a lot of outreach um, with Common Cause. What is what are you seeing as the reasons why turnout is low? And have you identified specific areas, as Secretary Merrill had mentioned, um, young voters? Um, being one of them and minorities, what are you seeing? Well, I think that um, I, first of all, have to thank, thank you all for having me, but also to thank the Secretary for the leadership she's taken on modernizing our elections and our voting processes, because I think we've actually done tremendous things just, in, just during her term, and, and I think that's incredibly important. And, but I would say that around the country, on the other hand, <laughs> we are seeing an in enormous increase in what are basically voter suppression tactics and in, in strategies being used by, in many cases, groups who are much more defined as fringe groups or groups that are, are hyper-partisan who are very interested in, in making sure that their particular candidate wins, that they are utilizing strategies um, such as robocalls to tell folks that, that um, their polling place has changed when it hasn't necessarily, or using text messages. Um, that's sort of the latest thing that's being used in, in different states, text messages of misinformation to voters about election day or about what's going on in their particular polling place. So this is, we see this as being quite, quite frightening, and especially in terms of the numbers that both Dr. Chambers and, and the Secretary gave us. Um, we're already struggling at a deficit in terms of participation. And this is, is putting a certain amount of fear into various populations, and I would say as well for seniors, um, many of whom do not have the kind of ID that's now being required in a number of states around the country. It's really restrictive 
voter ID laws are passing, have passed recently around the country, and are making it even more difficult for folks to participate. Um, I was telling the secretary that I went in this last election, brought my mother, who had just moved back north with me, to vote, and she was very worried about this because she came from a state where they had a little voter ID card, and she now no longer had a card that worked for her here in the state. She hadn't been able to yet change her driver's license, and what was she going to do? And so I said, okay, we'll go with your bank statement, because you do not, in Connecticut, need a photo ID to vote. So she was very apprehensive about this. She thought for sure I was making this up, I think. So we went with our bank statements, and, and uh, it was absolutely fine, because that is an acceptable form of ID in this state. And so she was incredibly relieved. But. So there are lots of challenges that we're facing around the country, but Connecticut doesn't have many of those. We luckily, that. that's right, luckily. But back to the people who can vote and who do not vote or who do not register. Um, how do we get to those folks? I know this is a question, Secretary, that probably keeps you awake at night. Um, how we increase participation so that we do truly have a representative democracy and that we further that democratic process. Uh, well, we're asking exactly that question. I have several projects underway where we are reaching out to the various communities around the state, and we're basically asking people. And uh, we had something called the Civic Health Index Project. It's a national survey project that we uh, embarked on with the Everyday Democracy, which is a nonprofit group. And um, we did a report. We, did, we asked some of those questions, um, and using census data and other data, one of the things that came through to me, which was quite interesting, I thought, was that in the end, when you ask people, why did you, do, why did you join a church? Why did you run for office? Why did you participate in whatever civic organization or activity you participate in? What, what made you do it? And it all comes down to one thing, because someone asked me. Now, that's a fascinating thing when you think about it, because that's actually true of me as well as many people I know in politics, but it's also true in life. And I just wonder if we have asked people enough, and maybe that's what education is all about in a way, but it is something we need to think about. Have we really asked new minority groups in? Have we really made sure they feel welcome, I guess I'd say, in our democracy? Do they understand truly the meaning of their role and, and how we want them to be part of it? Because I think we need to back up and ask why we want, or what is a truly representative democracy? Why does any of this matter? You know, I, I know a lot of people who say, hey, if people can't be bothered to vote, why should we care? You know, if they, we fought for all these rights, the rights are there, and they're free to use them if they want to. So why should we be out beating the bushes to get these people to vote? What is it that has changed? What is it that has well, changed? Now, it, Professor Chambers, you may have some a background on this in terms of other democracies. Do other democracies have higher turnout? And well, if we used to have higher turnout, I guess my question is, what happened? What changed? We, we've seen low voter turnout since the 60s. I mean, we, we've seen low voter turnout really even before that in the U.S. I mean, there are some important differences between the U.S. and, and some other systems. One would be, um, as Secretary Merrill pointed out, other countries where registration is simple, the government automatically does it for you. Some democracies have elections on Saturdays. Um, so for, if you're a poor family and you are, let's say, working two jobs, it can be very difficult to get to the polls. And you've got to figure out child care if you don't want to bring your kids. I mean, for some people, it's, there are those barriers. So weekend elections, um, uh, election holidays, fines for not voting. I don't think that would be very popular in the United States, but in some democracies you get fined if you don't vote. Um, so those are some differences. Also, I mentioned this before, that we call people to the polls very often, which some people say depresses our voter turnout. Um, but, yeah, I think that, that there are, are still things that we can do. I mean, it could be people reaching out, more of an effort to reach out, simplifying the registration process, um, being clearer for people about how elections actually work, and um, I think that there's been there's a lot of concern that well maybe I don't know enough to go and vote. My students will sometimes say that. Well, I don't really know enough. Um, I don't know all the issues, and I'll say, well, I voted in I voted in an election in Ohio where dog catcher was on the ballot, and I just went with a partisan choice on that one. But 
you don't have to know everything about every issue. And also with the increase in ballot initiatives across the country, that I think also compounds the sense that, well, I don't know, I don't really know what that means, because sometimes they're confusing. I don't really know what this ballot initiative means, and there's all this stuff, and uh, it's hard to get there. Yeah. Well, Secretary, you mentioned education as being a component, something that your office has been working on. Are we educating our kids differently? Are we not um, educating them about our democratic system, about our, 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 our process, the election process? Again, I guess I'm still looking for what's different, what has changed? Or are folks perhaps just overwhelmed with maybe it's, tech, maybe it's just too much. Maybe it's the ads on TV, one after another after another. Maybe people just give up and say, I, I can't, I, I don't know, I don't know what to do. Well, there's probably been about a 50-year drumbeat of, how, of negativity about government and politics generally, and I'm sure that's not helping. Um, although, when I go out, I just spoke this morning to a group of students, um, 120 uh, government students at a high school, they were terrific. The, the young people are very idealistic. I mean, they really want to get it. They really want to be part of all this, a lot of them. Uh, and so I don't, you know, it is a different time we live in, and it's much more complicated. People don't have the same ties to their community. They move a lot more. I mean, the class this morning, I asked how many of them lived in the same house that they were born in, about half of them. You know, which is more than usual, actually. Mobility is a huge issue, you know. It's just people are, are, are more isolated, perhaps, than they used to be. But then there's, you know, I mean, there's certainly a lot of information around, particularly about presidential elections. So there's a lot of people that just say, I don't like either one of them, and I'm just not going to vote. And to those people, I usually say, well, you know, no candidate's going to be perfect for you. Make a list of the things you care about, and then figure out which one comes closest. Part of this is also the demise of party politics. I know that sounds like a funny thing to say, but the parties have never been weaker, actually. And most people, when they register to vote now, register as unaffiliated voters. They're scared of, pol of partisan politics. It's become so kind of vicious. But it's also, parties were ways of packaging a set of ideas. And if you lose that, you're left drifting around in the middle trying to figure out who all these people are. And you'll never be able to figure them all out. As you say, how you, you're not going to know who's running for dog catcher. You probably don't even know who's running for state representative in your district. You're not going to know them personally. So unless you can settle on sort of one of the parties as at least kind of capturing your set of principles or values, you're, you're sort of adrift politically. Yeah. Sherry? I was just going to say that I think that's right, and I think that's very difficult to do, to actually be able to settle on a particular candidate do you think reflects things that you're concerned about. And I think I agree that, that there is a real dissatisfaction with, in general, with government and in, specifically with elected officials and a feeling that, that citizens have that, well, they don't represent me. I mean, look at the state of things. What are they exactly, what have they done since you know, since I voted for them the last time, how how is it that they're showing me that that what what they said they would do, they did, and I think that that that's incumbent upon upon those people who are in office to really talk about what you know what it is that they're doing and how it is that that that, that impacts the folks in their district, perhaps, or in their community, and I think that's that's something that we we work with two um, votes coalitions in one in New Hampshire and one here in Hartford, where we really do make an effort to bring people in, local leaders and nonprofits and folks in those communities, to talk about what are the issues that are of, of great concern to you and how is it that you can make sure that we have events where they come and you can ask them questions or, you know, something that's a little less formal than, than you know, them speaking at a, at a really very specific debate where the questions are already prescribed. So this, we're trying to give more opportunities for people to get more information um, and to compare candidates as they're running for office. Let's take a really specific group that the Secretary had, had mentioned, the 18 to 30 group. Um, I have an 18-year-old daughter, 
and uh, I'm, she's very, you know, very involved in, in, in politics, knows what's going on in the world. Now, she has not picked up a newspaper probably in, in a year, and she spends most of her time looking at her phone. And she actually is very well informed, but it seems to me that that group, we need to reach them in a whole new way. And, Professor, you're probably the closest to that group. What do we need to be doing to, to reach these kids? Not that some of them aren't very involved and very committed, as, as, as you mentioned. But I always, I always say that, well, of course, the students I'm, I'm, that are in my classes are political science students, often majors. So they have an interest in politics. But even among those students, they'll say, I'll say, well, are you registered to vote? And people will come up after class and say, I just, I don't understand how to do it here. I mean, can I, can I vote here? Or can I vote at home? Where should I vote? And I try to help them make that decision where they will decide to vote. But the, even just the choice is complicated. And again, registration requirements in different states are overwhelming to some of these people, too. I mean, imagine yourself an 18-year-old first-year student at a new school. You're dealing with the everyday issues of life and this issue of voting and the confusion um, and, and inaccurate information that sometimes goes between students is a real barrier, I think. Um, but even after they leave college, that issue of mobility is a big one. That continues. So if you move from Connecticut to California to, you know, wherever it is, people are moving for jobs. You have to know and you have to keep up with everything and know what the rules are. And if you're in a state where you have to have photo ID, you've got to make sure you've got the right license and you've got to make, you know, I mean, it's, it, it can be complicated and I think overwhelming to some people in that group. I don't think it's that they're not interested. It's that they feel like there are all of these extra hurdles. And that brings up, of course, the, the issue of online registration um, and using the Internet um, in order to help people register, um, help people vote. Where are we right now in Connecticut with that? Well, that has been uh, a big initiative from my office, actually. I believe you need to go to people where they are. And that is where the new generation is right here on the phone. And so uh, we're making more and more efforts. And it's not just the new generation, by the way. Some of us live on our phones. So. Um, and it, we, we have an initiative. We will have online voter registration in 2014 uh, through a new statute we just passed. There are several other state, uh, states that have it. We are not exactly on the forefront of technology in elections in Connecticut, I will tell you. Uh, we're still pretty antique. Um, you know, the 169 towns all doing it their way. Uh, so it's not atypical of a lot of the ways we do a lot of things. And it has pluses and minuses. But uh, So we will have online voter registration for people who have driver's licenses, because that way we'll be able to cross-check the license with the DMV. So that captures the between 60 and 70 percent of voters. That will make it easier. And not within the not too distant future after that, we'll have it online uh, through your iPhone. So you'd be able to register online. Online voting, I am still very skeptical of. And I don't think we're there. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I used to be one of those people that said, hey, if you can bank online, why can't you vote? Uh, there's actually a very good reason that right now we can't do that. And that is because it's anonymous. And so you can never really tell where those votes are coming from unless you're going to give up the privacy of your right to vote. So, and I don't think we want to do that. So I'm not there with the online voting yet, but I can see where in the future that might happen if we can have the securities in place. Uh, and, uh, you know, again, there's lots of other things we can do to reach out to younger voters through social media. We're all starting to use uh, Facebook and other forms of so social media. That is the wave of where it's going, and I think we have to be there with the new generation. How does Common Cause uh, stand on uh, some of these issues, such as the online voting, uh, registration and voting? No, I, I absolutely agree on the idea of online voting. Security in place now to, to allow that to happen, and we absolutely have to take a couple of stands on the country on this issue. But we do support online registration, and I think that, that is um, something that will attract more younger people and uh, folks who haven't necessarily taken the time to find out where the registrar's office is, go there, figure out where to park. I mean, there's just a million ways that it's difficult to. To actually do registration that way, or to know that you've done it in time if you've done it on, in the mail. Um, I think we also we also passed in this last session a really important um, 
improvement or, you know, enhancement to our election system, and that is that we will, in 2014 as well, have, have uh, same-day registration, election day registration here in Connecticut. That's passed in Hawaii um, as well for the, with the same timing. So that will get folks who, who didn't necessarily come up with the idea three weeks ago to actually do it, you know, there. But we will have it, it will only be at in one place, not at every polling place here in this state, and I think that'll give us a chance to see how that works and give more people an opportunity to participate. Are there figures that show how much that improves, how many more people you register that way? Um, that many. Oh, yes. Yeah. Actually, no, there, there have been several studies done. And right. I think it's between 10 and 12 percent right. uh, increase in mm -hmm. participation. That's a big number, actually. Yeah, I was thinking that there was a study in Wisconsin that was lower than that, but it's around that everywhere, I think. Yeah, but, yeah possibly a little lower. Possibly but I, I don't think we're going to see a huge no, no, no. rise, no, but we, we will. We we, it's, it's certainly an improvement. Right. Um, the other thing I was going to mention is just that it's not when we talk about voter fraud. I think people are sometimes thinking there are people who are out there trying to vote multiple times. I don't think that that's actually the problem. I think it's more on the receiving end, making sure that nobody is tampering with the results right. in a major way. So that's the fraud that I think we have to be worried about, not that we have people who are going to try to vote for some, as somebody who's dead or something you know, that we used to hear about in Chicago and that sort of thing. That's a good point. I mean, we have virtually, we have no record of that ever happening in Connecticut. I mean, maybe it has happened, but it certainly has never been reported. You're right. When people use that word voter fraud, I think it's used to cover a multitude of different behaviors. And that's one of the problems when you have this discussion, because impersonating a voter, going in and saying, I'm John Smith when I'm not John Smith, that just doesn't happen. And, and that's why this discussion nationally has been so difficult, because I think at first when this whole issue came up, people were like, well, of course, what's the problem? We have IDs for everything. What's, what's the problem with requiring identification? Mm -hmm. And the answer is it wasn't the requirement of the identification. We actually do require identification here. It's what kind. And it, it became very, very specific in some of these states and very deliberately, you know, showing like in one state, I think it was Texas, where you could use your gun license. It had a picture on it, but you couldn't use your student ID, even though it had a picture on it. So there were things like that, that you have to look more closely at what the purpose was. And it's clear that those decisions are being made by politicians, and citizens have a really hard time dealing with that, that those decisions are not being made by the consensus of, of folks in the, you know, that community or even in that state. So, that, and why are they being made in the way that they're being made in certain states? I mean, people have been very clear that in this state, if we do things in this way, then my candidate's going to win. Yes. You know, we'll be able to control who votes, in our community, and therefore, you know, we're at an advantage. And I do resent that. that. I don't mean to interrupt you, but I do want to leave time for questions. We've touched on so many different issues, and we have such experts up here. Um, do we have questions? And I think Paul will come around and uh, with the microphone, and if you could just wait for him to get there, over there. This was for uh, Secretary Merrill. I think you had mentioned going out and, and talking to people about voting, but is the question ever asked, why did you not vote specifically? Like, I know you didn't go out to vote. Why didn't you vote? As opposed to kind of the other questions that you had mentioned. Um. When we did our civic health index question, it wasn't done that way. It was more an aggregate of numbers of people and what groups of people were or were not voting. Uh, the one time we have sort of asked that question is of particularly the Hispanic community, particularly the Puerto Rican community, because what fascinates me is that in Puerto Rico, there's a 90% 90, 90 voter turnout, and the very same people who will move here will not go vote. It, it turns out we have about a 50% registration of Hispanic voters, but only about 23% of those who register actually vote. So when we asked that question, we did do a focus group around that. And the answer was, well, in Puerto Rico, it's, it's back to what you said, it's a holiday. It's exciting. It's a party. We have election cake and everybody votes. It's just, it's sort of a cultural difference, you know, in the whole attitude toward voting. Hmm. Now, I have to say, I'm not sure Puerto Rico is any more democratic or uh, that their results 
it shows some great difference in terms of leadership. But I thought that was a very interesting point. Other questions? <laughs> Now's your opportunity. Yes. Uh, what role does the League of Women Voters play in helping to disseminate information that's nonpartisan um, on candidates and issues? And I know they had in the past been around a fair amount and took a leadership role. I don't know if that organization is um, active in Connecticut or not. Oh, absolutely. I've worked very closely with the League, uh, and they are literally, at this point, almost the only group doing really widespread voter education in a nonpartisan way. Most of the voter education now is all partisan. It's all done by candidates, not even by parties. And so it's a very valuable role. The League has hung in there through all these years. I mean, they were actually started, you know, with the birth of the uh, women, women's vote. So they're about 90 years old now. Um, but it's, it's more difficult for them to get people to the forums. They used to do these uh, debates. It's more and more difficult to get people to come to the debates. I've talked to them around the state, and that's, you know, it, it's, again, there's a shifting media thing going on. So maybe, I mean, they still do them uh, in many parts of the state, but they're now mostly televised uh, because you can't really get an audience to come out to these things. So that's changing, but they're still alive and well. Did you want to go ahead, Professor? Well, I'm saying, actually going to talk about something slightly different, but I think that's a, I was just thinking that the League of Women Voters, probably it's probably mm -hmm. online now, right? Whereas we used to get the booklets. Do you um, remember getting booklets? Yes. Even yes. in my 13 yeah, years in Connecticut, I sort of remember getting a book. Yeah, 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 and I haven't seen that. The inserts, yes, on the candidates, yeah. Do you have a yeah, question? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. You know, <laughs> Oh, you, you need this. Okay, fine. Um, uh, I, cake is always, a, you know, inspiring to, to people. I, I was excited about Puerto Rico. But um, uh, I did read an article recently about um, creating peer pressure uh, for people to go and vote, uh, where it is considered socially unacceptable um, not to be a voter. Um, and maybe you can talk a little bit about that. Um, I, they, they did talk about small towns, uh, small places where there were um, lists published um, of people who, who failed in their civic duty. So you might want to. Interesting idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't know, maybe subtle peer pressure would be a little bit better. For example, my daughter has been, you know, pushing her friends to make sure they get an absentee ballot. <laughs> I will say I've seen one program kind of work that way, um, and what it is is it reminds me of the old anti-smoking thing where the kids, um, it's in, I think in Oregon or Washington, they have a program where the kids can go to the polls with the parents, but there's a whole curriculum around, make sure your parents go vote, and, so, and there's some process by which the kids take something home and ask the parents all these questions. That works. Well, that gets back to the education. I mean, this idea of civic responsibility in education. Right. I think it's important. Um, I was just going to bring us back to one of the last comments that I made in my presentation about um, the importance of getting more people in elective office. So it's a little bit of a tangent, but I actually think that if we had more diversity in our elective offices, mm -hmm. Certain groups might be more excited about participating. Um, if we saw more Latinos, more African Americans, um, more women. I mean, women are 52% of the population, yet they're about 16% of the U.S. House and Senate. If we flip that over and saw 85% of the U.S. House and Senate as women, and we, we'd probably say there's there's a problem here. Like, where are the men? Where are the other groups? And um, we don't we don't challenge that very much. But I think it's this idea of getting people excited about politics, excited about political office, seeing people who are like them in office, um, that might actually improve democratic participation, I think. Yes, you actually read my mind because I was just thinking about that and I was going to ask you about diversity. It's kind of full circle back to women yeah. um, and, and where we started. Um, and I guess, um, you know, that's a trick in itself to get, to get people involved. But we certainly saw in the last presidential election when we had an African-American candidate. Um, what was the, the, the turnout was tremendous, wasn't it, uh, for the last presidential election? Yes. It, yeah. it was higher. It wasn't, higher. It wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't as high <laughs> as it never turned yeah, right? right. Um, but, it, so but there was a surge. But it, um, and you saw people who didn't typically vote 
voting in that presidential election. The hope that it would be there, that that same level of participation would be there in the midterm election did not material, materialize. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't a lasting effect, and it's, it, it really wasn't exactly what we'd want if we were going to say we had true majority rule and had a true democracy or, or a fully evolved democracy, I guess I should say. Mm -hmm. I just wanted yeah. to add to that, that that one of the things that Connecticut's done to increase participation in elections by a broader range of, of people is to have public financing of elections. And that has really changed the ability of regular folks like us to actually, you know, get involved and qualify and run and actually be able to run on a public grant rather than taking special interest money, which, you know, might put in, as we're seeing around the country right now, the avalanche of cash that's in elections, that's not possible if you're a participant here in Connecticut. Or, or and a pool of right. candidates who can self-finance. Right, exactly. So we've seen an improvement and an increase in participation across, you know, racial and ethnic and gender lines here in Connecticut that we're not seeing around the country. We have time for maybe uh, one, oh, yes, over here, Paul. Do you have a question? I'm thinking um, one re way we can do this is more education towards our children under the age of 18. Get them more trained in, in, in understanding of political, what, what we have to go through as well as in, in the community. But... Um, I agree with um, the lady who was saying, we're talking about a lot of the women who got ways to vote, um, that they're voting now since they had to be fight, we had to fight for it so long. But why isn't it that the men aren't voting as now as much as they used to vote before? Well, they're still turning on in, in good numbers. I mean, there, there's, a, there's, a slight, there's a slight difference um, in terms of men and women in turnout. Women are voting in higher numbers and we see that in, um, reflected in campaigns and who cam candidates are reaching out to. Um, men are still voting and there's also a gender gap. We've heard about that where women tend to vote Democratic, men are voting Republican. Um, we've seen that since the 80s as well. Um, but I think that the important issue is getting everybody to participate in higher numbers and your, the idea of education I think is key. One more question. I guess my question is, what would motivate a politician to change the very system that got them elected? Um, if, if they're benefiting by the low turnout, negative campaigns, things like that, why would they want to make these wholesale changes that could probably endanger their job? If, you're benefiting from, if a politician is benefiting from low turnout, what would make them motivate them to want to change the system? Good question. <laughs> I think it's the people who have to make the push for that, not the politicians. I think we have to, we as the people have to push for that type of change. Um, sort of like campaign finance reform at the national level, um, it's very hard to make changes that are long lasting and that are without loopholes because it's the people who are making, who are passing this legislation are people who benefit from the system. So I think it has to come from the bottom where people are saying, we need to change the system. We need to try to have higher voter turnout. Maybe it means some sort of national reform, even though states have control over elections. Maybe it's a national reform where the country says, we have to do something to make registration and voting simpler for people. We need to simplify it and create a system where there are no barriers. And the states are the laboratories for that. And that's why uh, here in Connecticut, we are making moves toward that that are not going on in the rest of the country right now. In fact, I think we're kind of swimming against the tide. And maybe, uh, maybe we'll, people will take it as a model. We'll see. But it has to work, you know. And so we'll see if it actually makes a dent. A lot of this is attitudinal, very difficult to change. You know, I think it's one piece of it, make modernizing it, streamlining it, making it easier. But there's something else obviously going on besides that. Um, modern campaigns. One other just thought I'd throw in is the way modern campaigning is done is the campaigns are talking to a smaller and smaller shrinking number of people. So, by, so for example, if you're uh, a Democrat 
and um, you, you can get lists of who's voted in the past, and you can get down to like who's voted in the last four elections. Well, that's your core voter uh, group, and it's a lot less expensive to just try to talk to those people and get them to vote because you know they're probably going to vote. So what's happening is the people who aren't even registered to vote, nobody's even talking to them anymore. It's 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 a real narrowing of who you're talking to, and I think that's having an impact. Uh, we have run past the hour. I want to thank all of you for hanging in with us and staying a little bit later. And thank you for your questions. And I certainly want to thank our panelists today for being here. And thank you all for being at Connecticut's Old State House. Thank you.